Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the fourth presentation in our series by Mab Kim. This is the last of the four, and we are very happy to welcome you on this beautiful day. I'm sure, as her title is Cheeps, Chirps, Hoots, and Whistles, if you've had your window open, whether your car window or your house window, you've been hearing all sorts of things out there. So tonight we'll get a little bit more in-depth knowledge about some of the things that we're hearing and that we will hear. I will be moderating the questions. So if you have any questions, please put them into the chat. And at the end of the program, Matt will take them and we will take them in order. Before we begin, I would like to uh, inform you that we have 12 recorded Zoom presentations, both of those that we've given ourselves and also co-sponsored with North Branch Nature Center. And they are on our website which is greenmountainaudubon.org. So if you missed any of this talks before, make sure to head over there and to enjoy them as they will be there um, for the future. Mav has been teaching about birding for both CVU and Ollie Lifelong Learning. She herself started birding in the 60s and will tell us more about her birding experiences. <laughs> She's a published author having authored two novels and written a few articles for Birdwatching Magazine. So the sky is still blue. Let's tune our eyes and our ears to Mav as she gives us tonight's presentation. Over to you, Mav. Thank you very much, Tom. Well, that picture up there fortunately does not look like today. A cold winter day or a cold snowy spring day in Vermont can be really quiet. No noises, but maybe the crunching of your feet in snow or wind through the evergreens or maybe a chip notes of a little flock of chickadees. But then spring comes <laughs> and there is a virtual riot of bird noise. Birds that stayed in Vermont all winter suddenly have a ton to sing about. They want to find and defend a really good territory. They want to find a mate. They want to do courtship. They want to nest and raise young. And our year-round birds are joined by thousands of migrants. Birds that spent our winter south of here and re either returned to Vermont to breed or just passed through on their way to more northern breeding areas. Even non-birders cannot help noticing the amount of bird song in the spring, especially when the robin starts just caroling outside the window at 5 a.m. For birders, songs and calls add a really rich dimension to our enjoyment of nature. Birds announce themselves to us by song. Of course, that's not why they do it <laughs> for humans. <clears throat> But the sounds really help us identify birds and find birds. And people vary hugely in their ability to learn bird song, even to hear it or recognize it. There are a few rare birders who rely on sound almost exclusively, even more than, than what they see. But most of us try to use both eyes and ears and learning and recognizing some bird songs and bird calls help us identify what we're seeing and hearing. And even if we can't identify it, noises help us by drawing our attention to birds and helping us locate them. A group of us might not have seen this brown thrasher at all. It was in the foliage high in a tree, except it was singing continuously for about 20 minutes. So tonight we're gonna to talk about why birds make noise, and how they make noise. Now, humans love categories, neat categories. Nature does not. Some bird songs, quote unquote, sound like music to our human ears. Others don't. And what one listener might hear as song, another person might consider unpleasant or, or grating or just random sounding. This handsome bird, great crested flycatcher, doesn't have, doesn't have anything we would call a song, not to most of our ears, it just got this loud, emphatic reap. The distinction between bird song and the other noises that birds make isn't really strict and isn't completely supported by science. 
And ornithologists keep finding exceptions or variations. Here's the usual explanation. Song is what birds, mostly male birds, do to attract mates and to announce that they're on a territory that they are prepared to defend. Calls are usually shorter vocalizations and they can have a wide range of purposes. We'll talk about those later. And they can be made year round. And some very short calls are called chip notes. Well, here's a more intuitive, not very scientific set of criteria for deciding which bird noises are song and which aren't. And I'll be mentioning many kinds of noises, including sounds that are usually called song and others that really usually aren't. But first, how do birds make noise, all the different noises? Well, some birds go for the very easiest way, a way of making noise that every single human infant discovers very, very early in life. And that is pounding on things. Woodpeckers and their close relatives, the sapsuckers, hit things with their bills. And I really like this picture, by the way, because we can see part of this pileated woodpecker's tongue they use their bills to find food, of course, but when birds like this want to announce that they're around, either to attract females or to warn off other males, they find something that makes a lot of noise. In the spring, a pileated woodpecker or a hairy woodpecker or a downy doesn't want to drum on some solid piece of wood that just makes dull thuds. He looks for something hollow if he wants to make a lot of noise, something that resonates. And some birds find even better noisemakers. One day I was birding at Herrick's Cove, which was right outside Bellows Falls, and I kept hearing an astonishing racket. And I followed the noise, and I found a yellow-bellied sapsucker, like this guy, drumming on a metal sign. And I was absolutely delighted to see that the metal sign said, important bird area. It is possible to identify some unseen drumming birds by the pattern and rate of their drumming. Hairy woodpeckers tend to drum really quickly in bursts separated by rests of several seconds. Downies drum more slowly and more consistently with fewer pauses. Highlighted woodpeckers make big loud noises to match their big voices, or their big um, size rather, and their deep rolling drumming noises last about three to four seconds before they pause. But yellow-bellied sapsuckers have a really unique characteristic stuttering drumming, like da 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 Some birds don't drum, but they make noise anyway, and they make it with their feathers. When a ruffed grouse wants to attract a mate or is defending his territory, he doesn't sing. He hops on a log, curls his wing feathers, and flaps rapidly downward in a special motion. And the drumming noise we hear isn't really drumming, not like woodpeckers do, but instead is caused by the air trapped in his wing feathers and then forced downward. And two birds found in Vermont's wetlands also make noise with their feathers when their tail feathers vibrate during courtship flights. American woodcocks and Wilson's snipe use their special tail feathers to make very special noises during very special dances in the sky. And I, I've been listening every evening for the snipe that's usually right next to us in the wetlands, but I haven't heard him yet. Many species of hummingbirds also use sounds derived from wind and feathers in their territorial and courtship displays. These, by the way, are all Western species, um, not the ruby-throated hummingbirds that we have. And there's one Vermont bird that makes noise in a really unique way. He burps. American bitterns <clears throat> gulp in a lot of air and they roll it around in their throats. And then they use it to make deep noises that have earned them a variety of folk names, such as bog bumper, stake driver, and my favorite, 
thunder pumper. Here's a thunder pumper. This photo, by the way, only hints at how much energy these birds throw into their noises. They use their entire body. And American bitterns are heard much more often than, they've, than they're seen because they perfected the art of freezing when they're alarmed. They just point their head up, they look straight up in the sky with their eyes looking tense and nervous. The stripes on their front really blend in well with the cattails or reeds, which is where their usual habitat. So some birds do make noise with their feathers or by hitting things or by burping. <laughs> But most do use their voices, and they use a method that is both alike and not alike the way we use our voices. Birds, like mammals, can produce sound when air is forced through the trachea, the tube that goes down the throat, divides, and goes to the lungs. Our voice box is above the place where the trachea splits. Birds' voice boxes, which are called syrinxes, straddle the two separate tracheal tubes, and each part is equipped with sound-producing membranes. And that means some birds can sing out of one side while taking small breaths to the others, and other birds actually produce two separate songs at once. They duet with themselves, and we'll hear one in a few minutes. But as mentioned before, not all bird um, vocalizations are exactly melodic, this little bird uses its voice and its quote unquote sound, song rather, is nothing more than a squeak. It sounds like somebody very far off is pushing a rusty wheelbarrow very quickly. And the songs, so to speak, of elegant and beautiful cedar waxwings aren't any more musical than just high pitched wheezing sighs. Other birds coo like morning doves with their voices. And this species also makes sharp whistling noises with their wings when they take off. And some birds scream or screech. The hoarse scream of the red-tailed hawk is used oddly in movies and TV shows as a symbol of any wild raptor at all. It's used whether it's a hawk on the screen or an eagle or almost anything else. The sound is just like a symbol of wild. The diminutive screech owl <clears throat> makes an eerie downward whinny when it makes a sound. This little guy would have been totally invisible um, if he'd been in a natural hole in a tree, but we could actually see him. They're very well camouflaged little birds. Some birds make beautiful or simple whistles, like the Northern Cardinal. They have many different songs. One is just a loud whistle. And unlike many female birds, the Lady Cardinal often sings too. And a bonded pair of cardinals will do duets, one bird starting a song and the other taking over so smoothly that it's hard to tell which one is actually singing. One of my favorite of the cardinal songs sounds like pretty bird, pretty bird, pretty bird. And these birds also have very distinctive chip notes. They're loud and sort of metallic. Many birds do more complicated whistles. The white-throated sparrow has a sweet, pure whistle song that many people hear as old Sam Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. with some variations. And by the way, if you have a field guide that was published uh, north of the border, he's not saying old Sam Peabody. He's saying, oh sweet Canada, Canada, Canada. And in addition to all the whistling and pounding, drumming and burping, many birds produce songs that we hear as, as song, really. And members of the thrush family are the very best um, example of that. They're known for beautiful and sometimes haunting songs, actual melodies. And a minute ago, I mentioned a bird that can sing duets with itself. 
Well, the Viri is a small um, forest thrush that is known for this beautiful spiral downward song that is actually two separate noises at once. I haven't heard that yet this year, but I'm really looking forward to it. It's one of my favorite songs. The hermit thrush, Vermont state bird since 1941, used to actually be called um, the American Nightingale because of its beautiful song. But I personally think that the wood thrush is the very best singer in the northern woods. Let's listen to a wood thrush's beautiful flute-like song. And the familiar American robin is also a member of the thrush family. And the robin's cheerio, cheer up, or cheerly, cheerly song is a first thing in the morning noise in cities and towns and rural areas across its very wide breeding range that encompasses most of the United States. There are three birds whose songs are always described as robin-like and can sometimes be confused with robins. The National Audubon Society says that scarlet tanagers make hurried, buried, repetitive warbles like that of a robin. And they also have a really distinctive call note that sounds like chipper, chipper. There are some species that sing while flying, but in general, bird song is delivered from prominent perches. And scarlet tanager males almost always sing near the very tops of trees. The sweet robin-like song of a rose-breasted grosbeak has inspired many a tribute. One person in the 1800s wrote, it is so entrancingly beautiful that mere words cannot describe it. And others have suggested that rose-breasted grosbeaks sound like robins that are drunk or unusually happy or have had opera training. And Baltimore Orioles, well, they're related to blackbirds. So if you don't look at the colors, you realize this really looks quite a lot like a red-winged blackbird in size and shape and bill, the pointed bill. They're the birds that make those pendulous nests that look like limp socks. And they have clear, loud, whistled songs with a lot of individual variation. And they can sound somewhat like robins. But they also make a really odd chattering noise that sounds like small pebbles being rattled in a, in a can. Eastern toys are oversized sparrows with dramatic coloring. Their song is loud and very easily recognized, often described as drink your tea hee 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 hee, drink your tea hee 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 hee. And a good place to hear drink your tea hee 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 is the Shalott Park and Wildlife Refuge in about a month. You can also hear them at Japrag, um, what's the name of it? Japrag Country Park, Community Park rather, in Heinsburg. These birds also have another loud noise that's pretty recognizable. Their call sounds like chwink, chwink. Some birds not only sing, they have huge repertoires of songs, snippets of songs, imitations, other noises. These are the mimids or mimics, birds that share the unique ability to copy noise from their environment and then to string together noises to make their own music. Gray catbirds, like this thoughtful individual, are birds of hedgerows and, and thickets and undergrowth. They're usually sort of reluctant to fly across open areas. They prefer quick, low flights through vegetation. But when a male catbird gets to singing in the spring, he sometimes just sits right out in the open and belts out his song. Northern mockingbirds aren't particularly common in Vermont, but they can be found alone or in pairs throughout the year, even sometimes in the winter. And unlike catbirds, 
mockingbirds are definitely not shy or retiring. They make themselves easily visible by sitting and singing on shrubs and trees and utility lines and fences and poles. When I was in college, I spent some time with a friend who lived on Long Island and Pam was a, a music major. So she had records, old fashioned LPs of all the greats, like the, the things we learn about in Music 101. And she played them a lot. And the mockingbird outside her bedroom window started every single morning with a note perfect rendition of the beginning of Beethoven's Fifth. A bird that easily rivals the mockingbird as top songster is the brown thrasher. These birds actually have one of the largest repertoires of any North American songbird. One single thrasher may sing more than 1,100 different songs, including imitations of other birds. As a rule, by the way, you do not see brown thrashers in snow, but this bird actually hung around a Burlington backyard, at least until March a few years ago. So we've now seen and heard <clears throat> several birds with, with many diverse bird noises, but the question remains, why are they doing it? It can't be just for our entertainment and our delight. Why do birds make noise? Well, for the most part, not exclusively, but for the most part, singing birds in our area are males. And their most common reason for singing is to say, this area is mine, keep away. Birds, again, mostly males, pick out areas that have food for them and their mates and their offspring, cover to let them hide from predators, good nesting places, good available nesting material, and no obvious dangers. And then they defend that area against other males who are out looking for exactly the same things. Male birds also sing to advertise themselves. While they're singing the praises of their awesome, awesome territories, they're also telling females about their own health and vigor. Their spring songs are designed to send the message, I am the greatest male of my species that has ever existed. For different species though, that successful advertising has to take uh, different forms. Female song sparrows prefer males that incorporate parts of the songs of other males in the area. They really like variety. Female starlings, on the other hand, tend to choose males that don't display much variety or individuality or creat creativeness. In addition to spring and territorial courtship songs, I love this little guy, birds also make noises to beg. Fledglings of many species continue making baby noises well after leaving the nest to continue getting food from their parents who sort of follow them around the backyard. This young song sparrow was too new to have even grown a tail yet. He could feed itself, but he also spent time fluttering his wings and begging a parent to bring it some tasty in insects. And some female birds make begging noises to entice a male to mate. One spring morning, many years ago, I was sitting in my parents' kitchen in central New York State, and I was having breakfast with my Uncle Fran, who was then in his mid-70s. He'd been widowed for several years, and he just recently introduced the family to a new lady love. Fran and I were alone in the kitchen, and he pointed out the window to a little brown bird that was on the ground near my parents' bird feeders. Its wings were spread out to its sides, and it was fluttering its wings. And he said, what is it doing? Is it injured? And I told him it was a female house sparrow and that it was telling the male nearby that she was ready for mating. And I added that females of that species particularly sometimes request or even demand sex so often in one day that the little males end up exhausted. Well, my gray haired uncle heaved a great sigh. Ah, yes, he said, for the first time in my life, I just pause to let, we get a message every now that the internet connection is unstable. 
So I paused. I didn't want to waste this line here. <laughs> My gray-haired uncle heaved a great sigh and he said, ah, yes, for the first time in my life, I understand those kinds of demands. Birds also make noise to keep in touch with other birds. All through the winter, we can hear small chips from chickadees and nuthatches and other species. And these chips keep feeding flocks together. Bern Heinrich of UVM and Heinsberg studied golden crowned kinglets like the little bird in the top right corner. These tiny fluffs of energy somehow make it through the coldest winters in the Northeast Kingdom, the coldest part of Vermont. Well, except for the top of the mountains. <laughs> Heinrich found that the kinglets listen for chickadee chip notes and the feeding noises of other birds. And then they stay close to the flocks so that they can huddle in with a large mass of bodies during the coldest nights. Some bird sounds are specifically complaints or warnings. One of the most common is the loud thief, thief of the blue jay. Chickadees are masters at giving warnings. Researchers have found that these familiar little birds can give very specific information to other birds about the mobility and the relative threat of a nearby predator. The number of Ds in that classic tickety-dee-dee -dee -dee song gives detailed information about the predator. If the threat is big and slow moving like a human, the chickadee may say three, four, or five Ds. But for a small agile predator like a northern shrike or a sharp shinned hawk, the chickadee may give as many as 20 DDDs, a frenzy of warning calls. And in late summer and fall, some bird noises appear to be just for practice. Our little juvenile song sparrow had incomplete plumage and also an incomplete song. And there's also a possibility that birds might make song just because they can just because it's fun. So birds make noises for a wide variety of reasons and birders rely on bird sounds to locate the birds and identify them. But we can't always rely on sound alone for a lot of reasons. Many species make many different sounds. Chip, many, they make calls and songs and chip notes, alarm calls, angry calls, keep away calls. Black cap chickadees say their names, that chickadee dee dee, and they also do the hey birdie <whistles> that some people call the spring song, even though it starts very often in January. And they have a gurgly or a water, watery noise, and they make noises to keep their feeding flocks together. And in addition, the fledglings make very special begging noises when they're young. And another complicating factor is that the same species in different locations can have different local dialects. We're really used to the red-winged blackbird's spring song that sounds like conkree. But red-winged blackbirds in Texas, the exact same species, and other southern states don't make that exact same noise. And studies have shown that song sparrows that nest on different islands off the coast of Massachusetts and other Atlantic states have different accents, just like humans have different accents depending on where they live. Most of the work, by the way, with dialects and birdsong has not depended on human hearing, but on computers that can analyze the sound and actually print it out in, in um, sonograms or things that we can see. <clears throat> And some individual birds actually have a repertoire of individual songs, different from any of those of the rest of their species. And studies have shown that the same birds can alter their pitch and volume depending on their surroundings. Low frequency sound is most effective in obstructed, densely vegetated habitats because low frequency sound elements are less likely to be degraded by reverberations off sound reflecting vegetation. And high frequency sound like trills 
something with rapid, rapid modulations, might be best in open habitats because they degrade less over space. And studies have also established that birds tend to sing louder and at a higher pitch in urban areas, which sort of makes sense. It's to ensure that their song will be heard over all that ambient noise. So bird noise is a wonderful enriching addition to the world around us. And it can help us locate birds and it can help us identify birds, but it's not always possible to use birds alone to identify birds. So how do birds learn their songs? Well, most songbirds develop their songs in stages. They learn from their fathers and other adults in their vicinity. And they do something like an infant's babbling at first, sort of whispering bits and pieces of their father's song. So that when we hear them during their first summer, when their, um, their sounds may sound unfamiliar to us or vaguely familiar, but not right. But by spring of their first year, when they're almost one year old, most songbirds have mastered the territorial songs of their species. But some birds are hardwired for the song of their species. Even when they're raised in captivity, even when they never ever hear another of their own kind singing, they grow up singing pretty good approximations of the quote, right song. Let's spend some time now with birds who seem to make words. At least we humans hear them as words and we've assigned words to help ourselves recognize and remember them. When we were young children, we all learned that owls say who, who, and actually many, many owls don't say who, who, but the great horned owl really does. It does a ho, 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 ho. Barred owls are the most common owl in Vermont. They are diurnal as well as nocturnal. That is, they actively hunt both in dark and light conditions. They can often be seen in the daytime. We saw this bird next to a trail in Shelburne Bay Park just a few minutes past noon. The characteristic noise of a barred owl is a loud sound that we humans hear as who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. Who cooks for you? Who cooks for you? And they also sometimes just do Hoo! and they also do a lot of other noises. Barred owls can sound like monkeys or cats. They can shriek, they can moan, they can make a lot of other sounds. One time several years ago, a friend and I hiked up to a beaver pond above her house in Underhill and there were five barred owls around us and the noise was, the cacophony was unbelievable. They were making every possible noise that I've ever heard a bird make, I think. <clears throat> the next bird is not an owl, but it is heard and seen in forests all over Vermont. It's the oven bird. It got its name from its little pizza oven nest, which it builds right on the forest floor. It's a kind of warbler, but it looks very different from what we normally think of as warblers with their flashy colors and their habit of staying in the high, high uh, foliage. The oven bird's loud and almost constant song is often the first warbler song that people learn. It says over and over and over, teacher, 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 or tree, 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 tree. Robert Frost wrote a poem about the oven bird's song there is a singer everyone has heard, loud, a midsummer and a midwood bird. And Frost was right. These little birds sing into the midsummer, into July sometimes, when many of the other birds have stopped singing. So many people ask how to learn bird songs anyway. And one of the very best ways is just to spend a lot of time outdoors, listening and watching. When you can spend several minutes watching a bird as it throws back its head and sings, you're much more likely to associate that noise with that bird. <clears throat> there are tools and resources that can help. 
These are two online collections of bird noises from around the world. Um, I really prefer the second one. I think it's easier to use. You just type in um, xenocanto.org and then you type in the, the bird that you're curious about and you will get 20, 30, 40, 50 different recordings of that bird song in different times of day and different habitats. Um, it's probably not a great way to learn bird song, but it's a great way to check what you've heard and see if you were right. These are great ways to learn. These are relatively new. These are learning teaching apps. They were designed pedagogically to help people sort of get bird song in their brains. They have similar songs organized into useful groups. They include coaching, hints, quizzes, and games like, like computer games. The one on the top there, Larkwire, is the one that gets the best reviews most often. <clears throat> and some people, probably most people, find it helpful to use mnemonics. This word is often mispronounced, by the way. It's not pneumonics, which means having to do with lungs, um, like pneumonia. Um, mnemonic means related to memory. The word comes from an old Greek word. And a, a mnemonic is a device, a pattern of letters, a word, an association, a picture in your brain that helps a person's mind hold on to something that person wants to remember. I've already mentioned a few bird song mnemonics. Who cooks for you for the barred owl? Old Sam Peabody, 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 or Oh Sweet Canada, Canada for the white-throated sparrow. Cheerio, cheer up for the American robin. Drink your tea -he 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 for the Eastern toady. And tr tea, tr tea, tr tea for the um, oven bird. There's one very popular mnemonic for the warbling sound of the well-known, well-named rather, warbling vireo. This is a very plain little bird, but like all vireos, once he starts singing, and I say he because it's the he's that sing, he'll sing all day long from late April through mid-June, and it's long whirling sound. And people hear this as, if I see you, I will seize you, and I'll squeeze you till you squeak. Let's listen to the warbling vireo's warble. <clears throat> Another frequently used mnemonic helps people remember the sound of the yellow warbler. These are around all the time in the spring and summer. And if you get used to their song, you can hear it even when you're driving by, <laughs> even at speed. Uh, Bernie photographed this lovely little female as she was collecting nesting material. And her mate nearby was singing its repeated, sweet, 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 oh so sweet, 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 oh so sweet. There are many, many other mnemonics <clears throat> and each will work for some people and not at all for others. If you Google mnemonics for bird songs, you will find several excellent sites. There's one that's got something like 4,000 mnemonics on it. So when we hear birds singing, it's fun to try to figure out what they're saying. Is it a proud male advertising his territory and his own virility? That's probably the most common reason. Is it a mated pair? singing a duet to celebrate and strengthen the bond between them? <clears throat> is it an angry territorial bird chasing away an intruder? By the way, if you hear what sounds like angry, angry bird noises from more than one crow at a time or more than one blue jay at a time, it's really a good idea to stop and look and find out what's going on. Yesterday we heard just a, a, a riot of crow noise in the field across from us. And we looked over there and they were chasing something much bigger. And after watching for a while, we realized that there was some roadkill nearby and a raven had come and picked up the roadkill and the, the crows were just dive bombing it and, and attacking it from two sides, trying to get it to, to drop that roadkill. And it finally ended up with the raven sitting on a tree branch 
calmly picking apart whatever it was eating and the crows retreating. But I've also heard um, noises of ravens complaining and complaining. This was at Shelburne, um, Shelburne Farms. And I followed that and found out that they were dive bombing a great horned owl over and over again. So it really is fun to find out what's going on if you hear noise, uh, 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 a riot of bird noise that sounds angry. <clears throat> if you hear noise also, it could be a newly fledged bird trying to sound pitiful as it follows its parent around begging for food. Or it could be a young bird trying out a weak or partial version of the song it's gonna sing next spring. We can enjoy birds by looking at them, watching them, noticing their personalities, like the perky persona of this little chipping sparrow, or this curious golden winged warbler. We can appreciate their plumage, like the unexpectedly beautiful colors of this European starling. Turquoise and green and black and silver and bronze. We can notice special features like a morning dove's blue eye makeup. We can gasp at truly brilliant looking birds like this prairie warbler. And we can enjoy the behavior and antics of backyard birds that are really common, like the white-breasted nuthatch. Or we can just soak in the ethereal beauty of many of our birds, like this house finch. And we can re relish their sounds. Sometimes it's wonderful just to close our eyes outdoors so that we can hear without being distracted by seeing. It's wonderful to sit quiet, motionless, until nature forgets we're there. And until all the birds around you go back to the business of their everyday lives. And then we just listen. I wanna end with something from a surprise email that I got the day before yesterday from UVM professor Alan Strong because they're amazing. There are some audio clips that he uses in his ornithology classes that just blew my mind away. So I'm going to stop screen sharing so I can get to his clips. Song sparrows are well-named. I mean, they actually do truly sing. They have lovely songs and they have many different songs and they sing often and their song has regional dialects, and they have a wide range of individual variations in their song. And female song sparrows reward males with varied song by mating with them. Well, here's a typical song sparrow song. If there can be called a typical song sparrow song, they have so many different songs. But here is that exact same song slowed down a little bit. And I want you to listen to all the extra little grace notes and trills that this bird is doing. Now, the amazing thing is that that may be actually what other birds hear. It is possible, no one knows for sure, that birds may exist in a different time frame than we do as far as sound. They, also, they certainly exist in a different reality than we do as far as sight. They, many, many birds see way over at the ultraviolet end of the spectrum, excuse me, hmm can't remember if it's ultraviolet or infrared, they see colors that we don't see at all. Uh, for instance, male and female chickadees look quite different to each other, even though they look identical to us. And they wouldn't look, they'd look different to us if we see them under ultraviolet light. It's possible that just as birds live in a different sight 
world than we do, and they also live in a different sound world. Here's one more. First, let's enjoy the beautiful, long, sweet, whirling song of a winter wren. These little guys <laughs> pack more punch into their song than almost any other bird. They actually deliver their song with the same power per unit weight as a crowing rooster, and they're only, you know, three inches long or something. Here's the, the first, um, the, the uh, winter wren. We're not hearing the whole thing now. Are you hearing any of it? Just the very first notes. So really? Have it, if you go to share screen, you, you can actually share your computer audio under advanced options. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't know that. Because it's just going through your speakers and I think it's, it's yeah, it's not coming through to us. I so share screen, it. advanced options, com okay. share okay. computer audio. Advanced options. I don't see advanced. Oh, yes, I do. Now it's coming through. Now can you hear it? Do you want me to do the Song Sparrow again? <laughs> Let's do that again. Okay, because it's just so cool. Here's the typical Song Sparrow song. Now let's listen to the winter band if you want to sing. Okay, that's beautifully. Uh, good. That's the Winter Wren's beautiful song, and we've heard it once this year. Um, just a beautiful, amazing song in the woods. And here is that same song, Slowed Down. is really working at making song. That's just beautiful. Let's, let's listen to the, the uh, song sparrow again. I'm sorry people didn't hear it before, but I've just learned a new skill. Um, here's the typical song sparrow song. And here is that same song slowed down, doing all sorts of trills and grace notes and, and lovely little additions and weird things. <laughs> I think that's funny. And one more. Hermit thrush is our state bird. Here's his beautiful, normal song. And here's what he sounds like slow. just eerie <laughs> and lovely. Um, so I thank Alan Strong for sending those because I this is, I did not know about that at all. So tomorrow morning when you wake up, you probably won't hear any of the noises slow like that, but you will hear a lot of bird noise tomorrow. You'll probably hear red-winged blackbirds going conkri, and you'll hear robins going cheerio, 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 and you'll hear the song sparrow doing his regular song. And you may hear chickadees saying, hey, birdie. And you're going to hear quite a few other songs. 
make sure that you actually listen. Take a moment or two to listen to the bird noise outside your window and try to imagine all that complexity that we hurry up humans usually don't even notice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mab. That was entertaining and very informative. I loved hearing the, uh, the slowed down version. Do you remember when you and I were birding over at Woodside and we were followed by the ruby crowned kinglet? That's also a master singer that people can look up. Uh, at this point, I'm looking and we don't have any questions at all. So well, let's see if anybody does have a question. If you do, please type it into the chat and I will relay it to, to Mav. While you're doing that, I'm gonna play, ruby crowned kinglets are going to be heard very soon. They're tiny birds with a very big noise and it's one of the most lovely. So here's a ruby crowned kinglet song and Woodside is a great place to hear them. We're not hearing that the whole song. Huh. I don't know how. Have you have you heard other things like the Viri earlier? Yes, it's just the we haven't heard the, the but that's okay. People can oh. go to Zeno Canto and exactly. can go out on their own. You have given us the roadmap, you have given us the inspiration. I agree with you that people should in these two beautiful days coming up. Get outside, close your eyes, and hear what you can hear. To everyone who has come to our program tonight, we thank you. Remember again, we have 12 other recorded Zoom presentations at greenmountainaudubon.org. We invite you to come and see them and at your leisure and to uh, uh, enjoy them. So now we are pe having people, thank you, Matt, for another great talk. Just want to thank you very much. So we, the Programs Committee and the Green Mount Audubon Society, want to thank you, Mav, for a brilliant and successful conclusion of your four-part series. To everyone else, I wish you a good evening. I wish you great birding. We will see you soon. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>